This is not for you to fail, it's for you to learn. I'm not here to torture you. Yes, I might torture you mentally. I have a little weird thing about using the brain. So I might stress you mentally, but after the stress period, you'll understand why I did. Because if you don't really push yourself, you don't stress yourself sometimes, you won't learn and you won't even know that you're so good at doing so many things at once if you don't push yourself. I tend to always see the details in stuff. If you train yourself to see the details or the smallest things sometimes, the bigger picture is easier. Remember I told you in the last session that you had protein, carbohydrate, cholesterol, and you had phospholipid bilayer, hydrophobic, hydrophilic region. But I also told you guys about cell junction. Cells are stacked together, sometimes beside each other, most often beside each other, especially in multicellular organisms. Cells will have to stack, or similar cells, cells with similar characteristics have to stack themselves alongside each other, above each other, below each other. So naturally they'll have to communicate. They have to learn how to live with one another. As a result, cells are anchored from the top, from the side, from the bottom by different proteins. If you remember the last slide, the last PowerPoint, I had intercellular junctions. Know those. I'll go through that today in this lecture a little bit more, but you should know that there are tight junctions, the anchoring junction, there's the gap junction. So these things exist between cells to hold the cells together and also form channels to allow ions or substances to pass through the cells or allow the cells to communicate. So that's an important thing to know about cells. Those three things will be the core component of the next session. Uh, I also want you guys to have a laboratory application as well. I'll focus a little bit on the structural component that the cytoskeleton. We try to relate it to mechanics as well. Actin, filaments, the intermediate filaments, the microtubules, so that form flagellum or pili, I would say know them. So in terms of the laboratory component of it, I'd probably just have you guys see Trichomonas vaginalis. I said it to you yesterday, uh, where it does this little tumbling thing. We call it tumbling motility. And that's basically because it has this flagellum and it allows it to move. So I think that would be good for you guys to see in terms of laboratory application. Today, our session will be, let me just pull it up and share the screen. So today, so today our session will be on epithelium, a little bit on exocrine gland. You guys already need to know so much about the glands like the endocrine, exocrine. Yes, you should know that they exist. Yes, you, you should know that they have function and they're made up of cells and different types of cells. But the most important thing would be to know the epithelium. So you guys clear on what we will do for the next session, just to make sure that you know what to study for. As in the quiz session mm -hmm. or this session? Quiz session. Uh, yeah, so you said the parts of the microscope, mm -hmm. now what is cell membrane, mm -hmm. what intercellular junction, and then for the laboratory application, you'll we'll have to know about that like, cytoskeleton and those stuff like microtubules. Yeah, exactly. So if I ask you a question as it relates to the session about that, it would just be for you to identify flagellum or cilia or sterocilia. The session would be where you actually observe the tumbling motility or we can think of even parasites or other microorganisms with external projection that we can just observe in the lab so you can appreciate that you know there's a microtubule or microfilament that way i guess we could apply it to the laboratory setting the following session will be more tailored to this whole point this that we'll talk about today so it's going to be more on epithelial tissues or histology so not necessarily all epithelial tissues could be connective tissue remember connective tissue we'll do i think that's the next lecture we'll also talk about muscle tissue and as well as nervous tissues so those are going to be upcoming lectures but for the lab you might just come in to look at histology like slide where you probably come look at muscle tissue or a cardiac um, diet or cardiac uh, muscle tissue with the integrated tissue do you remember what type of muscle what type of muscle lines the bladder I think somebody smooth asked muscle. yes, smooth muscle. Any other example of where you can find smooth muscle in the body? Intestines. Anywhere else? Not a part of you, but you were uh, nurtured into this. The uterus. Exactly, the uterus. So we can begin the session now. If you 
guys are clear on everything, all right? One more question. Yes. Today's epithelium and subcranial gland. We're not going to really talk too much about exocrine gland. The most important thing for you to really know is the epithelium. We will be looking at connective tissues as well, muscle tissues, nervous tissues. You guys learn these things in any other course? Not necessarily at the cellular level, but like we've spoken about these different tissues in our human physiology before, oh. but not necessarily the details on the cellular level. You need to know that there are four basic types of tissue. I'll definitely ask you that four basic types of tissue. So for the next session, first question might just be, what are the four basic tissues, all right? So you need to know that. So you need to know you have connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissues, and you'll know all the details about these tissues eventually. Epithelium is a continual sheet of cells that cover exposed body surfaces, internal cavities. Epithelial tissues cover body surfaces. They cover your skin, external body surface. It covers your nose, your gastrointestinal tract, your respiratory tract, all, all tracts covering internal cavities. So depending on where it's covering, there are different cells and the characterization of the cells also vary based on whether it's external or it's internal. So whether it's covering an external lining or an internal lining. For example, this image right here is the, you're looking at a squamous epithelial that lines the large blood vessels. What you will understand eventually is that squamous epithelium, simple squamous epithelium is called endothelium. Anybody remember the embryologic origin of endothelium or blood vessels or the cells that line blood vessels? Remember you have endoderm, ectoderm, mesoderm? Uh, ectoderm. Uh, uh. The epidermis would be an example of ectoderm, right? Yes. How about so, the blood vessel? Probably mesoderm? Yeah. yeah, I think so. What's important here is this is basically just showing epithelium. But what this is also showing is a stratified squamous epithelium. Sounds like garbage right now, but I'll explain it in detail. Here, if you look, this is the epidermis. This is your skin on a histology slide. Up here, remember, I said in the last lecture that at the base, the skin cells are called keratinocytes. And because they contain keratin, if you look at the top here, you see some flat flat cells. These are keratinocyte flat cells. They're also likely dead cells. Remember I said that at the base, the stratum basale or the basal la layer is also known as stratum germinativum or the germinal layer. Germinal layer where you have the stem cell that reproduce for keratinocyte. We'll just rise to the top. You have multiple layers of cell. If you look here, this is like one cell. And then as it goes to the top, it looks a bit flatter, the cells. Nuclei come completely disappear are gone because the cells are dead. So this is just showing the layer of the epidermis on a histology slide. If you look at the base here, this is basically the basement membrane. And down here, you have the connective tissues. And you'll learn that you have different types of connective tissues. Epithelium can be a single layer of cell. In this case, this is on this multiple layers of cells. So this is called a stratified squamous epithelium. They're all is attached to the basement membrane and the blood supply sometimes comes from here. You don't need to know that. Remember, we're talking about epithelium lining body surfaces. So that was the epidermis, the skin. So the epidermis forming the skin. And we know that the epithelium line body cavities. This is a different type of epithelium. For example, this is in the pancreas. So you have epithelium or epithelia everywhere. They're just different types of cell, different arrangement of cell. Naturally, because the cells have different function, they can't all look the same. So the keratinocytes on the skin have completely different function from the hepatocytes in the liver, from the... Um, pancreatic cell in the pancreas. All right, the pancreas as well, based on the function of the organ, the cells will be arranged differently. The cells will also look differently because they'll have different composition, different constituents. So we know that the typical organelles are going to be in the cells. For example, the mitochondria might just be a little bit more rich. The Golgi apparatus, depending on what the cell is um, primed or functioned for. So that's just an example. 
example of epithelium lining the external surface, example of epithelium lining the internal body cavities, organs. This is the gallbladder. So the type of epithelium will be different based on the function of the cell or based on the organ. So if you look at the gallbladder, right, these are just different types of cells. They are columnar cells, which means that they're tall. You see, like we said, epithelium, epidermis, you have squamous cells. Squamous cells means that they're flat. Columnar cells means that they're tall and they, they look more like a column. The skin, the ones on the skin are flat. These are tall. That's like a big difference between the skin and the cell in the gallbladder. If you look at the apical or the top of the cells, this is the nucleus, like a single layer of cell here. And most of them, as we said, this is the epithelium, the cell here. It's a simple epithelium because it's just one layer of cell. It would have been stratified if there were multiple layers of cells. The epidermis would be what? Would it be simple or would it be stratified? Stratified. Exactly. Would be stratified, why? Because it consists of several layers of epithelial cells. Exactly. But now you're looking at the gallbladder, you see one layer. So look at the cell, it looks like a column right here. See the nucleus right here? But what's important about this type of cell, if you look at the top, you see microvilli. Remember that not all cells have cilia. Remember that not all cells have sterocilia. Not all cells have flagella or flagellum. So everything that's there, there's a specific reason why it's there and that's why i always say there's always an answer for everything if you look again epithelium classically they have a single cell layer or multiple cell layers so this would mean that it's simple if it has a single cell layer or it would be stratified if it has multiple and they always attach to the basement membrane here basal lamina and these are just different proteins fibers that make up connective tissues and you go into the connective tissue okay a bit more detail. I'm using my mouse and I keep scrolling forward. Right, so this is histology of the intestine. You see this empty space that you see right here is a lumen. So this would be like a transverse section of it and you cut it in half. So this is basically how you're looking at it through on the histology. So this is the lumen. These are the cells projecting in the lumen and it's the same way you can see the epithelial cell layer here. Gastrointestinal epithelial cells are going to be different from the cells on the skin. Top of the cell, you can have microvilli, you can have cilia, you can have cilia all around it, you can have stero sterocilia at the top. What's important is in the gastrointestinal epithelium at the top, you have microvilli. And there is a reason why there's microvilli on it. Anybody knows the function of microvilli by any chance? It increases the surface area for absorption of nutrients. Perfect. Very good. In terms of the embryologic development of epithelial tissues, during the embryologic period, epithelium invaginate into underlying tissues. They form secretory glands, they form organs, body surface, and cavity. And there are two classes of epithelium or epithelial cells, covering those covering the lining of glands, and there's also those covering external surfaces. They have function. They have some of them, for example, example on the skin it prevents pathogens from entering the skin so they're like um, they act as a mechanical barrier even for thermal regulation to regulate your temperature they have different functions based on their location this diagram is just showing in the embryologic development or in the period where you have the invagination so you start with a group of cells called epiblast that becomes ectoderm then from that you basically have the mesoderm what is the function of epithelial cells broadly function to protect, to transport, to synthesize, to secrete. They act as sensory receptors. Sensory receptors are in the epithelial cells and the epidermis. For secretion, uh, gallbladder, you look at different endocrine, exocrine functions. For example, the pancreas, they make stuff, they secrete stuff. Insulin. So there are different cells, the mucus, serous, some of them make mucus, different types of protein. So they synthesize protein and uh, also transport. And we also touch a bit 
it on protection, for example, in the skin. The constituent of the epithelium, we already know it can be simple, can be stratified, single or multiple. They are going to be held together. The cells are going to be bonded or held together by intercellular junction. And this, you guys need to know this. You have to know that cells are held together at the top by tight junctions, adherence junction or anchoring junction. So the tight junction is what holds the cell together. Anchoring junction also holds the cell together, allows some stuff to, to pass through. Desmosomes are also gap junction. These are channels that allow things to pass through or between the cells. So you need to know the function of a gap junction. You need to know that at the apical surface, you have tight junction. You have also anchoring junction where you have intermediate filaments and proteins communicating with cells. The image here is showing the picture and over to the right, this is an actual micro um, electron micrograph of a gap junction between cells. So this is a cell right here. This is a cell here, and this is how they're, they're held together. This is the desmosome here, and this is the adherence junction, and this is the tight junction. Tight junction, zanula occluding. Think about it, it's occluding. You should know that it's a tight junction. It's usually at apical surface, and it holds the cell together. Tight junction and occluding mean that it doesn't allow anything to pass through it. Through it. Tight junction keeps the cell together. So gap junction is where communication takes place. No communication takes place at a tight junction. Communication takes place at a gap junction. Know this diagram as well. See, I put it so many times. I know my slides, my PowerPoints can be like up to 60, 70, 70 80 slides. But a lot of times I put a lot of image and I try to repeat the image and you'll find that I repeat myself a lot. It's deliberate because I know that I understand that repetition is literally the only way you learn. And you won't learn it from hearing me say it. You'll learn it from repeating it yourself. So I'm in introducing it to you and the primary exposure will make it a little bit easier but the hard work definitely has to be done by you because you will never be able to remember these by just listening to me. This is also another diagram that shows the tight junction and the proteins that are there anchoring them. For example, the tight junction. We talk about the claudins and the occludins. You don't really have to know the names so much of the protein. Just know that adherence junction, yes, you have the calcarin. Just know that there's adherence junction. Know that there's that there's desmosome or and the gap junction and i mean if you know that there's connections or the connections are what form the gap junction you'll also remember that there are mutations that create diseases as it relates to gap junction this is just a typical arrangement of cell single cell layer and this is the basement membrane so remember there it can be single cell layer it can be multi multiple cell layer they at the bottom of the cell they're anchored a basement membrane by some protein called hemidesmosomes and they're usually just here. So you see like at the top, sometimes you can have the cilia, the serocilia, microvilli. At the side, you can have the intermediate filament. So you have the tight junction at the top and the adherence junction in the middle and the gap junction down here and the desmosomes as well, which basically is as a result of the connexin protein. You can have here at the base, hemidesmosomes that anchors in other protein structures in the basement membrane. So the basement membrane is a completely different entity and is made up of completely different things from the epithelial cell layer. Just know that the cell layer is anchored to the basement membrane by hemidesmosomes. And this is going further down. So from the basement membrane, you have connective tissues. And even with the connective tissues, you have different types of cells in the connective tissues. You'll get to learn that eventually. Like fibroblasts help to make a lot of stuff. We have collagen, minerals, glycosyl, aminoglycans, a lot of different things in the uh, extracellular matrix that helps to provide the um, structure and form. Your cells could definitely not exist without the basement membrane because the cell line has to be attached to the basement membrane and also be attached to connective tissues. So once you know that, you basically know every, everything about the human body. Different types of cells, they're all either multiple cell layer, single cell layer, anchored to a basement membrane with connective tissue. After that, it's more like the physical organ. You're looking at the microscopic level. Cells attached to the extracellular matrix. If you look here, you have the cell membrane. So think about this, this being the cell membrane. Remember the cell membrane have the proteins, they have the phospholipid bile, 
layer, all of these fancy things. It's not there now, but you should know it by imagination. You have different types of protein. Integrin is a protein that is in the cell membrane that is connected to the microfilament. If you look on this side, integrin also connects to fibronectins. At the cell membrane, there are just protein connecting to protein that's basically forming the junction. Apical, lateral, basal surfaces. Apical means top, lateral means side, basal is the bottom. So epithelial surfaces, know that there are different surfaces. Everything about, it's like basically looking at the dimension. It's looking at the top, looking at the side, looking at the bottom. The apical surface is the free surface. Apical surface, as I said, usually have the cilia, my, cilia microvilli the lateral surface between the cells you know already there are the junctions and the basal layer is connected to the basement membrane and the basement membrane if you magnify it through electron microscope you'll see that there are also different layers of a basement membrane. so what is basement membrane most epithelial rest on basement membrane an extracellular layer and it's a boundary between the cell and the connective tissue you have the cell the basement membrane and the connective tissue. You have the keratinocyte. If you look at the base of the cell, these are supposed to be some proteins, again, hemidesmosomes. They're attaching to the basement membrane. And this is just a magnification of the basement membrane. You have different layers, lamina lucida, lamina densa, named based on what you see when you look at electron microscope. Lucida means it's a little bit more transparent, dense, it's a little bit more dense. So it's like a clear region, a dense region that they're observing when they look at the basement membrane. So the basement membrane is also, sometimes they say the basal lamina, because if you look, this is the basal surface of the cell. Again, your lateral surface, the lateral surface, lateral. This again is the base of the cell and this is the basement membrane below the cell. So you have the basal lamina here and you have reticular lamina. And as I said, you have the connective tissue. And the connective tissue part, we'll touch a bit more in details for the next lecture. The base, the lamina, you have collagen fibers. Reticular lamina have reticular fibers. You will eventually know what the collagen fibers are. You will know eventually how the reticular fibers are formed. This, just like a, a small clinical correlation, because cells are attached to basement membrane. Sometimes, depending on the location and depending on the disease that the the person might have, for example, diabetes, you can have thickening of the basement membrane in the retina. So people with diabetes tend to have diabetic retinopathy affecting their eyes eventually. They have diabetic nephropathy, which is affecting the kidney. Also, diabetes can affect the heart and many other organs, even the brain as well. So it's just damaging the vasculature or the basement membrane. This is just showing a little bit more details in terms of the basement membrane. But remember that I said that the cell at the base, they are anchored to the basement membrane. There is hemidesmosome here, the protein. And the, uh, below that, you have the lamina lucida, dense region, lamina densa, and the sublamina layer. And then below that, you know, you have the connective tissues. The apical surface, know this. Apical surface of the cell, what do you find there? Cilia microvilli. Perfect. And what else? You missed the last one. I pili. <laughs> Start with S. Perfect. You have a good memory for details, Daniel. Very good. All right. So if you see something sticking off the top of the cell and they're all like, they're just like protein, they all can look the same. How would you know the difference between a sterocilia here versus a microvilli, you know, versus a cilia? The length, also the location of the cell, the type of cell, and many cells will have microvilli. For example, you will know that the gastrointestinal tract has cells with microvilli of the lie and as Daniel said for absorption. Stereocilia rare. You have them in your ears and also in the vast difference like the male reproductive or organ them there as well. So it's, you rarely have them anywhere else. Cilia have in your respiratory tract. Anybody know the function of the cilia and the respiratory tract? Or ciliated epithelium? It sleeps in dirt and mucus out of the airways or out of the lungs. I think it's, then it brings it to the what? pharynx where you swallow it it's uh, so the bacteria and other pathogens can be killed in the acid so you have to swallow it you can't spit it out <laughs> or, or you can't spit it out <laughs>
yeah, the cilia, they're there to, to trap particles from external environment. It's basically like a filter. You, you go and breathe in a lot of microorganisms, a lot of stuff from, these are all molecules, things, all of these things will interact with, the, you're interacting with the external environment. So even when you breathe in air, if you breathe in dust, toxin, or whatever it is, it's still you having contact with the external environment without even having any physical control. Think about it, you can bathe off your skin and the skin is just there to protect and you can just bathe it off whatever you breathe in there is nothing that you can do you can't bathe the air that you breathe it's only logical that the ciliated epithelium would be present present in the respiratory system to act as a filter for the air going through the lung or even getting into your body or getting into your lung in general so the microvilli are shorter. So the different microvilli are shorter and narrower than cilia. They contain bundles of parallel actin. So they have actin filaments. Not the first time you hear about actin filaments, right? Oh, no, not the first time. I've heard of it before. Okay, so now you know that the cilia actin filaments. And if you look right here, they're actin filaments with cross-linking proteins called villain fimbrin. So the cross-linking proteins here, these are the actin filament, microvilli. And if I ask you where we find microvilli, where would you tell me? What cell? What epithelium? What location? Microvilli. And you told me what the function was, right? The epithelial cells lying in the Just intestines. Just right. yeah. yeah. Or enterocytes. The enterocytes are the cells for the gastrointestinal tract. Like you have the keratinocytes, you have the hepatocytes, you have the enterocytes. This is just like a nice structure of microvilli. A bigger perspective, this is the cell. This is the apical surface of the cell with the microvilli projecting outward. You have the mitochondrion, and of course you have the cell membrane. So remember, the cell membrane is going to be here and the microvilli will just be projecting off of it. Most times these protein structures are active filament protein structures are projecting themselves from within the cytoplasm to the external so they go through the membrane and out of the cell this is also another picture so if you look at the epithelium here it's the microvilli all of these here are uh, projecting outwards this is like a lumen it's the white space it look like a lumen you remember what the basement membrane is made up of basal lamina lamina densa proper you would have the connective tissue in the intestine, you have villi. So you know how the, the cells are? The intestine, the organ, it just hold on itself and create crypts. Villi, these are villi. The difference between these, on the cell, you have microvilli. So look at the arrangement of the cell. Here, like along here, would obviously be the basement membrane, right? Along this line, because these are the actual cells. You see the nuclei? You see them? Yes. Going around. And at the top, you should have the microvilli. Micro, it's smaller than the villi. So these are just scripts or projection of the intestine. So if you zoom in, enterocyte, gastrointestinal cell. So stereocilia now are long, non-motile, apical projection from the cell. They're non-motile. The cilia, they can be motile, it's like you have flagellum and it's motile. Microvilli can be motile. Stereocilia, non-motile, and then extend from the cytoplasm they have actin protein and they're five to ten micron long so they tend to be longer than the cilia where you find serocilia the inner ear cell in your cochlea might just be a random question for example a multiple choice because it's just like so uncommon you have stereo you have serocilia probably two places in your body so you have these inner cells in your ear serocilia coming off of them we also have serocilia and this is most likely probably a vast difference or epididymic where you have stereocilia. If you see the difference, look at this. These are, this is ciliated epithelium here. So the cilia coming off, these, this is a stereocilia are much longer. So the cilium is an organelle found in eukaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells alone. Remember when I asked you about a bacteria with pili? Yes. You remember which one? The only one that we talk about over and over. Over and over. E. coli. E. coli, exactly. They, instead of calling it cilia, they call it pili. Cilia, they say, only found in eukaryotic 
prokaryotic cell, pili found in prokaryotic cell. So there are two major types of cilia, motile and non-motile. And if I ask you about the stereocilia, if it's motile or non-motile, what would you tell me? For stereocilia, is it motile? Non-motile. Non-motile. But cilia can be motile or non-motile, right? And it makes sense why it would be motile. Remember that the respiratory tract, the respiratory system is lined by ciliated epithelium. We call it pseudostratified columnar epithelium you'll get there i'll explain that to you shortly remember that the respiratory system lined by ciliated epithelium these have to be motile right so this is just a histology image of a ciliated epithelium you see the cilia up here projecting outwards yeah basement membrane down here and you have the connective tissue further down it's just like a high resolution of ciliated epithelium, high resolution electron micrograph of ciliated epithelium. In terms of the mechanics of it, we know that the projection of the cell, cilia, flagellum, whether they move, when they're moving, flagella, flagellum, cilia, cilium, they can move. If you look at the flagella here, you can see the direction that it moves based on the protein. And you know that it's microtubule that is usually in it that helps it to move as the central microtubule that helps it to move and if you look at the ciliated microorganism right here basically the direction of movement and there are different proteins that assist the movement so that the dynein but what's important to remember microtubules form the flagellum they are the actin filaments they have microtubules this is just showing a uh, bacteria paramecium with cilia if you look on the external surface this is also showing a ciliated parasite called balantidium coli anybody want to do an experiment and look in big doodoo under the microscope to see if they can find this parasite yeah that would be a yes, fun yes, yes that would, i think that would be fun get some pig doodoo and we can look to see we obviously weren't processing properly they plan to go abroad they like when you have publication and we should try to increase our publication output the cilium in terms of the protein structure microtubules so you have microtubule structure as well microtubules for the cilia microtubules for the flagellum and i mean they're uh, motor proteins this is the gastrointestinal tract again, showing epithelial cells, showing microvilli, and also the villi. The lateral surface of the cell, you guys already know this. I don't even have to go back over it. This is just creating emphasis. If you, if you get this diagram in the exam, don't think that I am not a nice person. Okay, because <laughs> I'm already telling you to know this diagram. This is just giving a little bit more information on the lateral surface of the cell. And you already know the apical surface, the lateral surface, and the basal surface where you have the hemidesmosomes. The basal surface where you have the hemidesmosome, you also have the basement membrane. So here is the basement membrane. You have the basal la lamina. You have the reticular lamina, basal lamina. You have lamina lucida, lamina densa. And remember that below this, you have the connective tissue and the connective tissue is made up of different things. And you'll get to know that. A little bit more on the basement membrane. The basement membrane anchored by Emis desmosome to the lamina lucida as well as the lamina densa and reticular lamina. So you have the basal lamina and the reticular lamina. And under the basal lamina, you have lamina lucida and you have lamina densa. The properties of the epithelium is dependent on the location and the cell type so if the epithelium is simple like it's just one layer of cells the nutrients will go to the cell by simple diffusion so thinness of the epithelium permits diffusion movement of gas nutrients from free space to underlying tissue the name of the epithelium is dependent on the location so it can be simple epithelium simple epithelium line the heart it lines the blood vessels the lymphatic channels all of these long tubular things in your body are lined by simple squamous epithelium your blood vessels are simple squamous epithelium the lymphatic tissue the entire system is simple squamous epithelium so it means that single layer of flat cells and the cells get nutrients by simple diffusion this simple epithelium you find it many different places for example you have a small membrane that lines over the lung tissues you call it your parietal pleura you have the same thin layer of 
are cell that lines the abdominal cavities, like the kidney, tissues or cell lining, a thin layer called peritoneum that covers the kidney, covers the intestine, covers the liver. All of these things are covered by a thing called peritoneum. And this is basically made of simple epithelium. The classification of the epithelium can be squamous, cuboidal, can be columnar, can be pseudostratified, it can be transitional, squamous, cuboidal, and it's usually dependent on the shape. So the squamous epithelium are flat cells. They are flat cells. The cuboidal epithelium are usually cube shaped, you know, like the ice cube. That's how they're normally shaped. So they are as long as they are wide. And the columnar epithelium are usually much taller like a column. They are taller than they are wide. So the squamous is the flat. The cuboidal is the tall as it is wide, like a square. Columnar is a large, tall column. Pseudostratified is in relation to the amount of cell layer. Pseudo is like a simple epithelium, but because the nuclei are just like haphazardly arranged, it looks like multiple layer but it's basically one so that's why it's called pseudo transitional epithelium is the epithelium that changes so it can be two three cell layers no and it can be look like seven cell layers a bit later and the classic example of where you find transitional epithelium is the blood and you remember that Right? So based on the number of cells, it can be a single, simple epithelium with one cell layer or stratified with more than one. So more than two can be two, three, four. Once it's in more than one cell layer, it's stratified. So look at the diagram right here. One cell layer, flat going across. Tend to line the blood vessels, tend to line the lymphatic tissue. Simple squamous epithelium can be simple cuboidal, single layer of of tube shaping cells and that simple cuboidal epithelium simple columnar epithelium is a single layer single once it's a single it's a si simple it's a single layer simple single simple single simple columnar it's a single layer of cells that look like a column and where do you find this an example anybody remember with microvilli intestines yeah. And then the stratified squamous is relating to the cell layer at the top. They're, they're supposed to be flat, but at the top, as long as the cells are flat, it's squamous. Remember where you find stratified squamous epithelium? The skin. Skin. Perfect. So stratified squamous epithelium, stratified because it's more than one cell layer. One, two, three, four, five, going up at the top, it's flat. So it's squamous. It can be keratinized or non-keratinized. So if I ask you where where do you find stratified squamous epithelium? Where would you tell me? Keratinized. The skin. The skin. They also have stratified squamous epithelium. You know where you find that? That is stratified with no keratin, non-keratinized. Arteries are the blood. Where is the end of the area? Endothelium. So it's a simple layer, a simple squamous. Right. This is just another, another diagram showing simple versus cuboidal versus columnar versus pseudo stratified. And if you look at the pseudo stratified, you see it look like multiple cell layer, but it's not multiple. The nucleus is just somewhere at the top here. The nucleus, but this is somewhere below that one. So it just looks like multiple layers of cell, but it's not multiple. So that's why it's called pseudo stratified. Where you find pseudo stratified epithelium? Respiratory system with cilia. So if I ask you where you find pseudo stratified epithelium, epithelium with cilia where you tell me the respiratory system simple squamous epithelium the blood vessel simple columnar epithelium the gastrointestinal tract non-keratinized stratified squamous keratinized epithelium the skin imagine you have in the gastrointestinal system you have simple columnar epithelium one cell layer just the absorption imagine when you reach the anus and you get it outside the anus you don't need that epithelium no more that's just biology trying to make common sense that you're getting into a different territory you need to change course so the epithelium literally is just completely different in order to facilitate passage of whatever you need it for so you definitely will need a different type of epithelium for that function simple squamous epithelium said all of this to you before it's just repetition now simple squamous epithelium consists of a single cell layer of flat cells. They're joined by intercellular junctions, which you know already. They're resting on a basement membrane, which you know already. One nucleus. This is just showing example renal tubule, blood vessels in the kidney. You can have simple squamous epithelium. And it makes sense. If wherever 
where you want absorption to take place, it makes sense to have a simple epithelium. The blood vessels make sense to have a simple epithelium. For the kidney, in the renal corpuscles, you have to remember the detailed part of the, the body. But you see the endothelium here, blood vessels, simple epithelium. You definitely will have to know that simple epithelium, endothelium is a simple squamous epithelium. So you already know the, the cytoskeleton that anchors the cell to the lateral surface. This is just an electron micrograph of the intercellular junction. You guys should remember this from the first image. And again, you know that they are held together by this mosome, side junction, gap junction. Stratified squamous epithelium means that multiple layers. So unlike the simple squamous, that is one layer of flat cell, this is multiple layers of flat cells. It can be keratinized or non-keratinized. The simple squamous, the blood vessels, epithelium. The stratified squamous can be keratinized or non-keratinized. Your skin is stratified squamous keratinized. Non-keratinized, you can find in your oral cavity. So where you don't have the skin, that dark skin, you know that this keratinocytes, this give your skin have the pigment. Wherever you don't have pigment, oral cavity, pharynx, epiglottis, esophagus, the vagina, stratified squamous epithelium. And obviously the vagina could not be a simple squamous epithelium, right? You need multiple layers of cells. You just don't need the keratin. That's also a good example to remember. If you look at the cell layers, multiple layers of cells, stratified, flat cells at the top, you see all them flat? If you look, look at this, keratin, how do you know the difference between a keratinized and a non-keratinized? Keratinized. Anybody can be observant and tell me? Well, the keratinized look like a deeper staining. I guess they have more cellular components. Look at the cell itself. Look at the cell layers. This one, they have the nucleus, nucleus, well, if a cell arranged that, 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 going all the way up, right? You realize that there are more cells at the bottom? So, you know, more cells at the bottom, you know, stratum vestali, right? And it, each time it goes up, goes up, goes up. On the skin, you realize no nuclei in these cells? Look at okay. the top. See that? Dead. Yes. Dead cell. So it's a dead layer of cell keratinized at the top those are nucleated non-keratinized also a histology again non-keratinized epithelium in the oral cavity so in your mold no keratin and in a mold stratified squamous epithelium no keratin the skin stratified squamous epithelium keratinized and at the top you have flat sheets of dead cells no nucleus so the epithelium can go through pre-malignant change Remember but we say that you have the non-keratinized epithelium in the vagina as well in the cervix. This is basically the progression of cervical cancer where you have the stratified squamous epithelium and then eventually, this is a normal epithelium, right? You see all the cells are arranged normally and it looks nice and everything all the way to the top. This cervical intraepithelial neoplasm one, this is just like at the early stage where it does not erode or invade the basement membrane. So look here, this is the basement membrane. This is normal cell, basement membrane down here. This is the epithelium, the multiple layers of cell. Down here, you see at the basement membrane. Look at the nuclei, you see how them get big? Remember I said that when there is malignant transformation of the cell, the, it proliferates uncontrollably and then you just have a lot of protein material building up the inside of the cell. So the nucleus get big and distorted and everything just looks disorganized, right? So if you look at the, this cell, cervical intraepithelial neoplasm, at the top layer, so the disorganization of the cell architecture. But down here, closer to the basal layer, it's pretty much preserved. The important thing is that it does not reach the basement membrane right here. Sin 1 <laughs> and Sin 2 is a little bit more disorganized. Sin 3 you can see cells and disorganization. That's why I would advise you guys, young girls, get your HPV vaccine because cervical cancer is a demon of women, I guess. Men, if you're circumcised, you don't carry around the virus to give it to female. Male, you don't have a cervix, so you, you don't give yourself cervical cancer, but female, we do have cervix. The HPV just needs to get on your skin, eventually get somewhere close to colonize and get to the cervix. And it can basically cause cervical cancer. And I've seen it in very young, young, young patients. Like one of my youngest patients was really shocking to me because she was really bad, for like stage four, where it's spread to her kidneys. She was so young. She was like 30 something. Just have her child like two years ago. 
And it was just like an incidental thing where she was just traveling and then she found out that she had it and she was stage four where it spread to the kidney already. And that was it. You're, all, you're young. You can get your HPV vaccine, Gardas Lil Cerberus. They protect you from a cancerous type of human papilloma virus. And it's the human papilloma virus that predisposes you to the cervical dysplasia, the SIN1, SIN2, SIN3. There are different types that are cancerous. A lot of viruses have malignant potential. You know why? Remember when we said that the viruses are smart, they incorporate into your genome and use your machinery, your organelles to replicate itself. Well, some of them can become dormant. Just imagine if they can become dormant into your body without having to replicate or asking you to replicate itself. It's already incorporating in your genome, so it's basically a part of your genetic structure, waiting for that trigger for it to replicate itself again. What kind of sinister parasite is that? It can be with you and be silent, and it can be with you and kill you if you want to. I don't know why I find that fascinating, but <laughs> I'm sorry. Simple cuboidal epithelium. Remember that we said the simple is one flat cell, one layer of cell, tall as it is wide, like a box. It rests on a base neck membrane, and you have a connective tissue line, and you have one nucleus, and this type of epithelium you find mostly in glands and ducts pancreas, the bile ducts. So if I ask you for an example of this one, I won't stress you so much to know about everything because every, like all of the cells are different shapes and different size for a specific reason. If, if I should require that you know the specific reason for everything, that would be unreasonable, which is why I'm trying to expose you to as much, but I'll also tell you exactly what you need to know so you know everything in the least stressful way possible. The simple cuboidal epithelium, we know already like the bile duct and I should already just highlight that in red case I, I want to ask it. Also in the saliva gland pancreas. This is a section of the kidney where are the simple cuboidal epithelium. See so look here. This is a lumen. This these this is the epithelium epithelium itself and this is the base membrane that is that it is on behind it. You can also have stratified cuboidal epithelium. Just like how we have simple cuboidal epithelium, one cell layer in the bile duct, stratified cuboidal epithelium, two or more layers of cells, and they line the ducts of sweat gland, exocrine gland. So like the sweat glands, easy to remember, these are lined by stratified cuboidal epithelium. This is a uh, close a look at the sweat gland. You see the stratified cuboidal epithelium with more than one cell layer, probably two cell layers. You see how it looks? It looks like almost one. I know it can also look like a lumen sometimes. I wouldn't even put this on a slide for, to have you know, tell me, because sometimes if you just look at it like that, it can look like a blood vessel and a blood vessel would be a completely different type of epithelium. It would be simple squamous. So this is like a sweat gland. So if I ask you a question, it would be the sweat gland, epithelium of the sweat gland. For each, you just need to know one example, one example of the simple squamous, one example of the stratified squamous, one example of the simple cuboidal, one example of the stratified cuboidal, and one example of the simple columnar, one example of the stratified columnar, and the example of the pseudo stratified, and that's all most of them. I mean, so the simple columnar, one layer of cell, and remember now, this is not cuboidal. The cuboidal is it is as long as it is wide. The columnar is a different thing now. Simple columnar, you already know the gastrointestinal tract. One layer, layer of cell, they are taller than they are wide, and uh, they're contacting a bit basement membrane as well. You have the apical surface, and you remember what is on the apical surface of the simple columnar epithelium of the gastrointestinal tract? Microvilli. Perfect. So you find them in the kidney, the stomach, the gallbladder, the, just remember the, the gastrointestinal tract. This is an electron micrograph, this black and white image here, electron micrograph of the striated border in the intestine. So you have the apical surface, two simple columnar epithelium, Blah, blah, blah. So the microvilli is here, MV, microvilli. Them have some of them have some protein stuff, glycocolics on it. This is the mitochondria, the cell. You can see the lysosome here. Then you have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, rough endoplasmic reticulum. What was the difference between the smooth ER and the rough ER again? The rough ER has ribosomes on, on yeah. it. 
All right, so this is nothing that you don't know. Also, another stratified columnar epithelium. Stratified columnar epithelium may have two or more layers of cells. You can see that this is these cells are columnar. You have nuclei, nuclei, nuclei. So this is two layer. You find them in the conjunctiva. Your eyelid, exo exocrine gland, male urethra is easy to remember where you find stratified columnar epithelium. Yeah. And the rectoanal junction is basically where it changed. So think about it. Your entire gastrointestinal tract is lined by simple columnar epithelium. One layer cell with microvilli, right? To allow for easy absorption, increased surface air, easy absorption of nutrients and all of that. By the time you get it outside of the intestine, where you reach to the rectum and the anus, you don't need no simple cell layer again. So it becomes thicker becomes stratified columnar epithelium and by the time it reaches outside of the anus you know what it becomes a stratified squamous epithelium keratinized right because it's outside now for protection so the pseudo stratified epithelium and they're varying size they can have on the apical surface cilia or sterocilia and these are the pseudo stratified epithelium it's pseudo stratified, as I said, because the nuclei, they appear at different levels. So it's one layer, but it's just that the nuclei are different. They're arranged differently. So it looks like multiple layers. So you would see this and think it's, wow, a stratified. It's not. It's literally just one cell layer and it's just arranged like this. And that's why we call it pseudo. If you look at the top here, you can see the cilia and pseudo stratified epithelium is very common lines your respiratory tract. So more than likely, this is like a respiratory tract well pseudo stratified epithelium with cilia on top of it. So all cells contact a basement membrane. Only some reach the surface and do not penetrate the whole epithelium. Some of them um, contact the free surface. And we know why it's pseudo. This is column here, Daniel. Yes, ma'am. So given its stratified appearance, like how do you distinguish it between true stratified? Basically, in histolo histology, rare that you'll find stratified epithelium with cilia on it anywhere. Yeah, if you see stratified epithelium here, it's not squamous. If it was squamous, then it wouldn't have the cilia on it. Yeah, uh, you would have to look like at the histology. This is like not a good histology uh, picture, but if you have like a good picture, you will have to look at the arrangement of the cell, look where the nuclear nucleus is, and just make sure you know that this is one cell, this is another cell, this is another cell. Well, this is obviously not a good picture. Important distinction is the cilia at the top. So this now is a pseudo stratified columnar epithelium, very rare. And I won't ask you anything on this because uh, we didn't even have to learn anything about this. But what you need to know is just the sterocilia that you already know can be a part of the apical cell layer. This is a micrograph of ciliated respiratory epithelium. So just remember that respiratory epithelium is pseudo stratified ciliated. The pseudo stratified ciliated epithelium lines parts of the upper respiratory tract, nasal cavity, auditory tube, nasal pharynx, larynx, trachea. You don't have to remember that, just remember the respiratory tract. They have mucous goblet cell in the epithelium. Anybody know the function of mucus or goblet cells? What else it produce? Just mucus? And what, what produced the what, what produce the mucus? Yeah, what yeah, protein cells? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, I'm not sure either. All right, so pseudo stratified epithelium lacking goblet cells. So, respiratory epithelium pseudo stratified. You know where else you can find go goblet cells? Somewhere that is columnar epithelium, simple columnar epithelium. The one place that we talk about where you have simple columnar epithelium with microvilli, yeah, intestines. Yeah, you can find goblet cells there as well. All right, so the structure of the goblet cells when the, the goblet cells make the mucus or mucin, or you remember the different mechanisms of transport from the cell and the cytosis exocytosis transcytosis vesicles yes. anybody remember anything like that so yes. rem remember that when you're thinking about goblet cells the mechanism of transport from the vesicle so the clinical correlation for the goblet cells, the goblet cells are found in the gastrointestinal tract as well, as we just mentioned a while ago. Clinical point is that in ulcerative colitis, you can, this is basically um, ongoing 
inflammations like an autoimmune issue or a familial thing where they have recurrent ulcers in the gastrointestinal tract, usually in the large intestine at the colon, and they have a recurrent inflammation and destruction of the gastrointestinal epithelia or the gastrointestinal enterocytes. And sometimes you can also have differentiation of goblet cells. So there's always a, a genetic mutation. If you want to do the study, we can look at which gene is mutated. We have a lot of patients with ulcerative colitis. You can get samples. You can look at the common gene that is mutated in these patients. So basically in ulcerative colitis though, destruction of goblet cells and impaired production of mucus like um, dysfunction. So sometimes in these patients, they have mucus in the stool. And that's one thing we always ask them. Like typically young patients too, having belly pain all the time. That diarrhea, greasy diarrhea, <laughs> fatty diarrhea. Sometimes I'll say that they, they tend to have blood in the stool because it's an inflammation of the gastrointestinal enterocyte. Remember, it's a single cell layer. Once you erode that cell layer, you expose the basal layer and the connective tissues, which usually have the blood vessels. So once they, ex once they have the inflammation that expose the, the epithelial layer, expose the blood vessels, you will have bleeding. So you tend to ask them, do you have blood in the stool? Yes, they tend to have blood in the stool. They will ask them if they have mucus in the stool. Yes, they tend to have mucus in the stool, especially in ulcerative colitis. Why? Because there is impaired mucus production or mutation where you have differentiated goblet cells. So sometimes the goblet cells are just basically mal malfunction. So the last epithelium now is transitional epithelium. It's multi-layered. It's also called a urothelium. It's transitional, meaning that it can vary in terms of the number of cells. So if you look at the bottom of the image, and did we say an example as, we, as to where you find transitional epithelium. <laughs> On the bladder. Yes, the bladder. So just always remember the bladder as a good example as to where you find transitional epithelium. It's multi-layered and it's transitional. Transitional, or I would call it dynamic <laughs> epithelium. It's always changing or it transitions from one day to the next. Sometimes, depending on the state, you can hold up to 500 or even 1,500 mils or, or 1, 5, 1 liter. Well, you're not supposed to hold up to one liter of urine. Ideally, you're supposed to hold half a liter of urine in your bladder. That's when your blood, bladder will start sending like an urge. Noise. When your bladder gets up to 0.5 liters, half a liter, you're supposed to get urge. In that case, your bladder would be distended. When the bladder is distended, it makes sense that the, the cell layer would be smaller. So you have like two to three cell layers when the bladder is distended. Obviously, it wouldn't make sense to have like multiples when the bladder is distended. So when the bladder is empty, no then you have a transition of the epithelium where you have five to seven cell layers. The more superficial layer of the transitional epithelium consists of large binucleate cells. So the free surface is convex and they have umbrella cells on it, tight junction as well. So this is just an image showing the difference between full and empty bladder. Serous cells, we, I think we're coming to an end soon. Serous cells, they produce watery proteinaceous secretion, which usually contains enzymes. Where do you find serous cells? You find them in the parotid, the pancreas, and the lacrimal glands. You know where the lacrimal glands are? Anybody? Where you cry? Where you cry from? Your eyes. <laughs> Not your mouth, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, so you have the lacrimal duct with serous cells in your eyes. And naturally, it produces that watery proteinaceous secretion when you cry. Mucous cells, you already know, we find them in the gastrointestinal tract, respiratory system as well. You can have the goblet cell in the gastrointestinal tract. You can have the goblet cells in the respiratory epithelium. It secretes mucin. It's a viscous microprotein that protects and lubricates the surface. Goblet cells are just there at the bottom producing mucin to line the cilia, to line the microvilli that lubricates it, that protects it. Especially in the respiratory system, it just forms a surface, it traps everything and then you <clears throat> 
clearing my throat is clearing mucus, mucin, as well as just random particles and molecules from the ear. So in terms of neoplasms, all of these cells, epithelial cells, line the skin, line organs, it can be simple, cuboidal, it can be simple or stratified, squamous, cuboidal, columnar, transitional, pseudostratified. These cells can undergo malignant proliferation, can have benign tumors, benign tumors coming from the epithelium, we call them papillomas. Usually they don't reach the base membrane. You can also have dysplasia and metaplasia where it basically breaches the basement membrane. Anybody can tell me what kind of epithelium this is? This is the last slide, I think. Uh, striated and it looks multi-layer, so that would be stratified. Mm -hmm. the stratified striated, I don't remember. Yeah. So it's stratified squamous. Stratified squamous. Perfect. Okay, squamous. That's it. Very good. Good job, guys. I think that's the end of the presentation. Any questions? No questions? No questions. Okay. Okay, so I'll have the lab prepared for you guys next week at two. All right, miss. Take right, yes. care. Bye. Enjoy the rest Bye. of your day. Thank you, you guys. Enjoy the thing. <laughs>